So, and today, tell me, uh, any one of you, where we have to read today? Is it the unknowable? Because Suki has not put it on the net, so on the chat, so I don't know. Yes, the unknowable third paragraph. If it is on, they have to read it or they have done it. No, we have to. We have to redo it. Okay, right. We read the summary in the end, Rangada, and then uh, there wasn't enough time to do that. I don't remember because there are other classes also in life. Yes, I understand that, Rangada. <laughs> I have to remember that it's not always. Yes. Life we read it. Yes. Only explanation is the remaining, no? Yeah, yeah. I, I can do that. Actually, life divine is two days following. So next day we remember. The first day that also you forget. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Yasmin, good morning. Yasmin has come. So we can start now. So as soon as everybody Bonjour. Bonjour. As soon as everybody gets a text, I'll start. So the unknowable if it is at all. 588, page 588, the unknowable if it is at all. So I start reading. The unknowable if it is at all may be a supreme state of Satchidananda beyond our highest conceptions of existence, consciousness, and bliss. That is what was evidently meant by Asat, the non-existent of the Taitiri Upanishad, which alone was in the beginning and out of which the existent was born. And possibly too, it may be the inmost sense of the Nirvana of the Buddha. Okay, so let's have a look at what you saying. The unknowable. Now, if it is unknowable, you don't know if it exists or not. <laughs> but then how do we know it is unknowable? Because there is always something beyond and something that is still questions come up. Even if you know the highest, there is always something that comes up. What is the ultimate? Okay, that sort of uh, question can always arise. So the unknowable, if it is at all, may be a supreme state of Satchidananda beyond the highest conception of existence, consciousness and bliss. So, Existence, consciousness, and bliss are such chit ananda. So even beyond that, there will be something. Okay. So if that is existing at all, that is what was evidently meant by asat. Because asat is, as you see, already he is giving you a hint. If it is at all, whether it exists or not, also we don't know. Okay. So we don't know how by the mind. And also there is another thing. If you go to the unknowable and experience it, it is the absolute, the supreme state, and the link with the physical world is cut. So therefore, you can't come back to give anything. That's why it remains unknowable. Even if an individual reaches there and knows it, he can't come back to give an, ex a, an explanation of what it is. Okay? So, beyond our highest conceptions of existence, consciousness, and this. That is why that is what is meant evidently by the asat. Because you should not interpret the asat as the falsehood or the non-existent. Okay. Again, that is the Upanishad. And also note non-existent, not non-existence, because non-existence is the impersonal aspect of the divine. It's a state of being. But the non-existent is the personal aspect of the divine. One who is existent. And how can he not be there? So that's why this is what is meant. What is meant is we cannot know it with our mind. That's what he meant. That's what he said. The Taitiri Upanishad, which alone was in the beginning. What was alone in the beginning? The non existent. Or in the beginning, before the world was made, and out of which the existent was born. Okay? So there is an absolute uh, non existence or Nihil, something absolutely beyond our conception, mental conceptions. And then from there, the existence. In other words, put it very simply, spirit is not possible to know ultimately, and spirit is manifesting the universe, which is matter. So out of spirit comes matter. Matter is existent, and the spirit is non existent in this sense that we can't know it. Okay? <clears throat> which alone was in the beginning. And out of which the existence is born. 
and possibly too, it may be the inmost sense of the nirvana of the Buddha. So, why is Buddha saying possibly? Because what was Buddha's experience, we really don't know, and what they are saying, okay, it could be, and also you can interpret it in so many ways. When something is indescribable, it is open to discussion and open to interpretation. So that's why possibly okay, so for the dissolution of our present state by nirvana, maybe a reaching to some highest state beyond all notion or experience of self, even an ineffable release from our sense of existence. Okay. Ineffable, that which cannot be spoken of, that which cannot be described, that which is beyond words. So that is what we're saying. That's why nirvana could be. Actually, that nirvana should not be interpreted, he's saying, as absolutely nihil. Because we have discussed this many times. The nihil is something which can be interpreted in two ways. It's an emptiness, emptiness of content. But that emptiness can also contain everything. Okay? So that's why it, so they say it could be interpreted in two ways. Not necessarily as the Buddhists say nihil. Okay? That's what it means. So, or it may be the Upanishad's absolute and unconditioned bliss, which is beyond expression and beyond understanding. Okay, so you are experiencing the existence part, but now he is talking about the not existence but ananda. Okay. Remember also that Satchit Ananda, they are all actually one. What is substance is also power, is also consciousness, is also ananda. It's all one. When it comes down, they split into seven different things. But at the highest level, they are all one. Okay. So if you are experiencing from a lower level, you could experience it as substance or you could experience it as the ananda. That's what Srimad is saying. Okay. Or it may be the Upanishad's absolute and unconditioned bliss. Unconditioned no trammels at all, no, um, nothing that can be limiting it. And all description is limitation. When you say something is white or something is black, you are describing it, you are limiting it. So description of anything is a limitation. So that which is unlimited, God is unlimited. So you can't describe him in any way. So you can interpret that as emptiness. <laughs> That's the whole point. This is our mental problem. There is actually probably no problem at all in the experience, but the formulation of it in mental terms is a problem. Or it may be the Upanishad's absolute and unconditioned bliss, which is beyond expression. There you are, beyond expression and beyond understanding. Understanding means mental understanding because it surpasses all that we can conceive of, conceive of with the mind, or describe as consciousness and existence. We have been talking about consciousness and existence, and now he is saying about the ananda. Whatever you experience, there is always the absolute. This is the sense in which we have already accepted it. So, in other words, Shirdi is saying that we don't, the integral yoga does not believe that Anything is beyond understanding and beyond conception. So you have to say that you have to understand it in this way that the mind cannot know it, but the consciousness can certainly know it. But you can't come back to the very good. Okay, In that sense, you have to take it. How can the divine be zero? Or how can the divine be non-existent? It's only a question of words. Okay. This is the sense in which we have already accepted it. In other words, mind cannot know it. For the acceptation commits us only to a refusal to put a limit on the ascension of the infinite. So we, we say that there is no limit. You can go on, go on, go on indefinitely. Progress in consciousness upwards. This is the sense in which we have already accepted it. For the acceptation commits us only to a refusal to put a limit on the ascension of the infinite. So what the others are saying is unknowable, we are saying it is unknowable at our present level of consciousness. 
this is how we take it. Or if it is not this, or if it is not the way we are describing, if it is something quite different from existence, even from an unconditioned existence, it must be the absolute non-being of the nihilistic thinker. It must be the absolute non-being of the nihilistic thinker. Nihilistic thinker, the Buddhist. Okay? So, if it is not the way we are interpreting, then it has to be something totally unknown. That's what it is. It must be the absolute non-being of the nihilistic thinker. Now, he is again going to argue on this basis. Is it really nothingness? Is it really not me? That's what he will take up. In fact, he is challenging the Buddhist philosophy. Okay, we read the next one. But out of absolute nothingness. So, one has to read again. So, yes, yes, yes. And, yeah, go ahead. But, but out of absolute nothingness, nothing can come. Not even anything merely apparent, not even an illusion. And if the absolute non-existence is not that, then it can only be an absolute eternally unrealized potentiality, an enigmatic zero of the infinite, out of which relative potentiality may at any time emerge. But only some actually, only some actually succeed in emerging into phenomenal appearance. Out of this non-existence, anything may arise. And there is no possibility of saying what or why. It is for all practical purposes a seed of absolute chaos out of which by some happy or rather unhappy accident there has emerged the order of a universe. Or we may say that there is no real order of the universe. What we take for such is a persistent habit of the senses and the life and the fitness of the mind it is useless to seek for an ultimate reason of it. Out of an absolute chaos, all paradox and absurdity can be born. And the world is such a paradox, a mysterious sum of contraries and puzzles. It may be, in effect, as some have felt or thought, a huge error of monstrous and infinite delusion. Of such a universe, not an absolute consciousness or knowledge, but an absolute unconscious and ignorance may be the soul. Anything may be true in such a cosmos. Everything may have been born out of nothing. Thinking mind may be only a disease of unthinking force or inconstant matter. Dominant order, which we suppose to be existence according to the truth of things, may be really the mechanical law of an eternal self-ignorance and not the self-evolution of a supreme self-ruling conscious will. Perpetual existence may be the constant phenomena of an, of an eternal nature. All opinions about the origins of things become of an equal force, since all are equally valid or invalid, for all become equally possible where there is no sure starting point and no ascertainable goal of the revolutions of the become. All these opinions have been held by the human mind and in all there has been profit, even if we regard them as errors. Or errors are permitted to the mind because they open doors upon things. negatively by destroying opposite errors, positively by preparing an element in a new constructive hypothesis. But pushed too far, this view of things leads to the negation of the whole aim of philosophy, which seeks for knowledge, not for chaos, and which cannot fulfill itself if the last word of knowledge is the unknowable. But only if it is something to use the word for the Upanishad, which being known, all is known. Which being known, all is known. The unknowable, not absolutely unknowable, but beyond mental knowledge, can only be a higher degree in the intensity of being of that something. A degree beyond the loftiest summit attainable by mental being. And if it were known as it must be known to itself, that discovery would not destroy entirely what is given us by a supreme possible knowledge, but rather carry it to a higher fulfillment and a larger truth of what it has already gained by self-vision and self-existence. It is then this something 
an absolute which can be so known that all truth can stand in it and by it and find there the reconciliation that we must discover as a starting point and keep as a constant base of thinking and seeing and by it find the solution of the problem for it is that alone that can carry in it a key to the paradoxes of the universe very big para okay so and uh, he is arguing from the normal point of view and he is saying that since we are all in ignorance and we don't know what is the is all sorts of theories are possible okay but he himself also is possible he is going to give a theory himself what is there but the other he say we cannot dismiss him easily they are there okay, so. we'll do one thing first of all we'll get the essence of what he is saying in a summary then we'll go sentence by sentence if you want to follow the logic that he is using here he is just using logic sent one by one so the what he is saying here in this para we the fourth para of this chapter out of nothingness because he has spoken about the nihil of the buddhist philosophy out of nothingness an infinite full of potentialities anything can emerge and there is no saying what will arise and what cannot practically it is chaos that could emerge he is discussing the uh, buddhist theory anything could emerge and there is no saying what will arise and what cannot practically it's a chaos that could emerge from the non existence and out of this chaos the world would have manifested itself by a fortuitous accident happy or unhappy according to one's experience and attitude in fact there are the materialist says that the physical world has come into a existence we don't know how so it could be an accident fortuitous by chance it has come into existence the materialist cannot explain because he doesn't know the origin of things okay? but man's view of this matter could only be a reaction of the senses and so we could say that there is no order in the universe out of chaos paradoxes out of chaos paradoxes contradictions absurdities could be born and it is asserted by some there were some thinkers who say that that the world is really so a delirium an error a madhouse okay existentialism schopenhauer and others okay they are the <laughs> existentialism is a, supposed to be a philosophy and they say that we can't explain it so accept everything and it is about schopenhauer i'm not 100% sure but some of the german um indologists and others they said that it, it's a it's a it's an error how can if there is a divine that exists how can he create suffering and pain so it's an error it's a mistake a madhouse <laughs> if the world now i go to the next part of the summary if the world is really so then it must have come from not consciousness and knowledge but from inconscious if the world is really a madhouse okay it can come only from the opposite of consciousness and knowledge but from inconscious and ignorance so anything can be true in such a world our thinking this is the logic that he is using okay? our thinking mind may also be a disease a mechanical force of inconscious matter all this is saying is not his view on huh? he is just discussing various possibilities depend basing ourselves on what we have experienced already mankind has experienced even the laws and the order that we see in the world could be only mechanical and ignorant and not the laws of a self evolving fully self conscious will <clears throat> the continuous existence of the world would be a phenomenon of eternal nihil an infinite existence in that case all opinions would be equally valid or indeed equally invalid because we don't know from where it is coming so if you think that it is coming from nothing the other conclusion that you will get that's what is saying okay that anything is possible okay but 
if you change your premise and say that the what you are calling the unknowable is not really unknowable and it's not negative but it is something very very positive the whole view changes okay and that is your new view but he is discussing the others views and dismissing them one by one he is dismissing but he is saying it is possible because man the human mind cannot know so everything is possible in ignorance then in fact the human mind has voiced all these opinions the madhouse delirium existentialism absurd existence meaningless world etc etc the you remember the uh, famous uh, quote from shakespeare okay he says this um, it goes like that okay <laughs> out out brief candle life is but an empty dream full of sound and fury signifying nothing so this is the research is pure idea but it is one of the i think it is othello who says that okay out out brief candle that is life okay life is but an empty dream full of sound and fury chaos okay meaningless okay signifying nothing so he was simply saying that all these opinions have been given based on your ignorance okay so in fact the mind has voiced all these opinions mad house delirium existentialism absurd existence meaning this world but even such views have their use and profit even if you are saying something wrong it can have a profit that's what i say negatively by destroying opposite errors and positively by preparing new theories however taken to extreme limits this way of thinking leads to the meaninglessness of existence and the worthlessness of all philosophical and spiritual aims so spiritual philosophy seeks for knowledge and not chaos and this unknowable must be something that in the upanishad words it must be if the world is to be meaningful that which being known all is known okay this is tasmin vidyate sarvam vidyata if i know that ultimate source of everything then i know everything the unknowable must be then not unknowable but unknowable to mortal mind that is what is meant let us recall that whatever exists in the universe is knowable to man he has said that earlier he is the microcosm of the macrocosm so finally there ought to be not an unknowable but a something not an unknowable but not not a nothing but a something something positive that explains all the mysteries and paradoxes of the universe it is a something that we must discover and make it the basis of our thinking and our life okay seeking thinking and seeking for the to bring meaning to existence that's what is said so after after discussing all the various theory that man has voiced he is now saying that there has to be something meaningful so the source which is unknowable when you say it is unknowable it only means that it is unknowable to mind not to consciousness consciousness can go my mental consciousness cannot go this is what he said it's a very big para and we'll go through each sentence okay. but these are these are logic these are music but out of absolute nothingness nothing can come not even anything merely apparent not even an illusion so in fact in here discuss this many places even science says that absolute nothingness is not possible okay and they they say nature abhors a vacuum a vacuum cannot exist nature will fill it with something other okay out of absolute nothingness nothing can come not even anything merely apparent not even an illusion okay? illusion also is something that cannot come from it and 
if the absolute non-existence is not there, then it can only be an absolutely eternal, unrealized potentiality, an enigmatic zero of the infinite, out of which relative potentiality may at any time emerge. But only some actually succeed in emerging from the phenomenal appearance. So I'm is discussing step by step. He's saying that let us agree that the absolute is really zero. Then nothing can come. But something has come out. The world is there. We can't deny the world. So therefore it cannot be an absolute nothingness. It could be something which you are interpreting as nothingness. Okay. And then what is that? It is an absolutely eternal, unrealized potentiality. Okay. It is not zero, but it is looking like zero, but it contains everything, unrealized potentiality. An enigmatic zero of the infinite out of its relative potentialities may at any time emerge. So that which is infinite and seems to be there is a second possibility, okay? That many, many possibilities can come out of it. The third one he would discuss is that that what you think is nothing is not really that. It is something absolutely positive and the divine is there. So one by one is eliminating the possibilities, the theories in the world. <clears throat> so unrealized potentiality an enigmatic zero of the infinite, out of which relative potentialities may at any time emerge. So, out of the absolute potentiality, relative potentialities are coming out, may at any time emerge. But only some actually succeed in emerging into phenomenal appearance. So, in other words, <coughs> from the highest level, many possibilities start coming, but ultimately, it becomes only some. And this is also true of the physical world, no? because out of the super mind come the, all the possibilities are there in the over mind level. But as we keep coming down, they, there is a process of diminution and elimination. And then finally, some things only appear in the physical world. Other things are all one by one eliminated. But they are not eliminated forever. They will manifest at some other time. Okay. That is the reason why you can also, as Sir said, 1920, 1922, he's saying India will be free. So if the potentiality was there and it became a reality. But that potentiality could have become, I'm explaining with an, with, a, with an example, okay? It could have been that entire Akhanda Bharat would become a reality. That possibility also was there, potentiality. But it didn't happen. That potentiality did not realize itself. Rather, what happened was it broke up into so many different. In fact, some of the um, northwestern frontier was not even included in India. Balochistan was not even included in India. Okay, Sindh and Punjab and um, Sindh and Punjab uh, and northwest frontier, they all went to Pakistan. So that happened. That's why Sergio says that. <clears throat> Afterwards, even when he says that unity will be achieved, but what that form of unity will be, we don't know. Because there are so many possibilities. In fact, now it looks very much like it will not be a geographical and political unity. It will be more a, like a federation. So, I am giving examples of what he meaning by unrealized potentiality. So, we don't know how the unity will come. We already know that Balochistan and Northwest Frontier Province, they are all wanting to join India. Okay. Balochistan definitely they want to join India. So what will happen in future? We are not sure. But these are the possibilities. <clears throat> so, and only some come into phenomenal appearances. Out of this non-existence, non-existence as we have understood it, anything may arise. Okay. Because it's a non-existence with potentiality. The first case was non-existence without potentiality that we eliminate, because the world exists, something has come up. So the second case, non-existence with potentiality. So that case, anything may arise. And 
there is no possibility of saying what will arise or why it will arise, which by some happy or rather unhappy accident, there has emerged the order of the universe. So now, why is he saying unhappy? Because when you look at what has come out, my God, there is suffering, there is pain, there is chaos, there is perversion, there is murder. So, is it happy or unhappy? We really don't know. <laughs> is, with tongue in cheek, he is saying this. Okay? And by some happy or unhappy accident, there is emerged the order of the universe. Or we may say that there is no real order in the universe. That also we can say. We see only strife and difference and war. Okay? So that's what we see. It can be interpreted in so many ways. Or we may say that there is no real order in the universe. What we take for such is a persistent habit of the senses and the life and the figment of the mind and it is useless to seek for an ultimate reason of things. Sri is not saying this. He is saying if we consider that second case of non-existence being full of potentialities, this is what we can see. We have to depend upon what our senses will tell us. That's what he's saying. And the figment of mind, what you can imagination also will tell you. And it is useless to see for an ultimate reason of things. This is the existentialist philosophy. Okay? The world is what it is. Don't try to justify and don't try to find reason for it. There is suffering and pain. Adjust yourself to it. There is no useless to see for an ultimate reason of things. All these ideas have been expressed in different ways by different people. That's why Sri is just seeing all the possibilities. Out of an absolute chaos, all paradox and absurdity can be born. And the world is such a paradox. Because we see all the dualities. Everything we see, opposites are also there. So you can interpret it in any way you want. But out of all these cases, the integral yoga will select one which is the most logical and which is the most meaningful to himself. Okay? And what is that? That the world is not a coming from a non-existence. It is also not coming from a non-existence of potentialities. But it is a fully conscious and meaningful creation out of something very, very positive. Nothing negative about it. Okay, that's what we will say. Or we may say that, that we have seen. Uh, so if that is so, how does an absolute chaos, all paradox and absurdity can be born? And the world is such a paradox, a mysterious sum of contraries and puzzles. He is talking of the dualities that exist in the physical world. Okay? All the dualities, light and darkness, thought and cold. Compassion and cruelty, all these things, also and truth, all exist. Or it may be, in effect, as some have felt or thought, a huge error, a monstrous and infinite error. Even if I accept, says the human mind, that there is a divine, but how could he have created the error of falsehood and suffering? Therefore, it's an error. Okay, so your conception of God changes. Or you will come to the conclusion that there is no God a monstrous and infinite delirium. All this is the logic that he is implying, see one by one and eliminating them. Of such a universe, the second case, the universe which is full of potentialities, not an absolute consciousness and knowledge. So, an absolute consciousness and knowledge is what Sri is advocating. But the others are not saying that. They are saying, a universe is full of potential, potential. <clears throat> but an absolute inconscience and ignorance may be the source. Okay. Anything may be true in such a cosmos. Everything may have been born out of nothing. Thinking mind may only be a disease of the unthinking force or inconscient matter. This is the materialistic theory. He is going on considering all these theories which dominant, uh, the dominant order which we suppose to be existence according to the truth of things may be really the mechanical law of an eternal self-ignorance 
and not the self evolution of a supreme self ruling conscious will perpetual existence may be constant phenomenon of an eternal may if you stick to the second case of the non existence being full of potentialities perpetual existence may be the constant phenomenon of an eternal nihil can be okay all opinions are all equally valid or invalid and this is a fact that all of them there are so many different <laughs> the interpretation can be infinite that's what he said and note whatever he is saying that is tallying fully with the way that he looks at it the super mind is something positive but you don't know it so you don't know from where it's coming and the over mind all the possibilities are there equally valid or invalid so he is going slowly towards that for all become equally possible where there is no sure starting point and no ascertainable goal of the revolutions of the people in fact that's what people say that there is no revolution there is evolution is not a random chance of mutations okay mutation of cells is creating all this thing. all these opinions have been held by the human mind and in all there has been profit you say even if it's a mistake it there is profit even if we regard them as errors for errors are permitted to the mind because they open doors upon things negatively by destroying opposite errors positively by preparing an element in a new constructive hypothesis if you remember uh, in the synthesis he has said very clearly error is a handmade not truth only if you make a mistake then you know the right way that does not mean to say that mistakes are justified and allowed you must benefit from mistakes otherwise they are of no use just like we benefited from chandrayaan 2 we made many mistakes and we corrected ourselves and yesterday <laughs> we succeeded because we had corrected all the errors na so that is what we have to do psychologically as well as materially by the way yes <laughs> yes it is chandrayaan chandra chandrayaan Okay, it was fantastic because India has landed on the South Pole where there is supposed to be ice, and if there is ice, there is water, and if there is water, human habitation is possible, and also if there is water, there is hydrogen and oxygen. So oxygen also is possible, and hydrogen can become a fuel. All this I was watching a CNN program, and this is what they said. So it's a fantastic discovery what India has done. Nobody has gone to the South Pole before. But India has done that. So the possibilities. <laughs> so errors are allowed. He said. So where is it going to? Positively, my people. But pushed too far, this view of things leads to the negation of the whole aim of philosophy. The second case where the what you call unknowable. Is really a potentiality full of things, but then there is this negation, and that's exactly what happened with the Maya Vada philosophy and the Buddhist philosophy. So your hypothesis must be absolutely something else. We have to start from such Ananda as a basis, not a nihil. And if you start from such Ananda, the world can be interpreted as. Very meaningful and not a delirium and not a mistake. All these things can be explained because there is purpose, and the purpose is evolution. Okay. But pushed too far, this view of things leads to the negation of the whole aim of philosophy, which seeks for knowledge and not for chaos, and which cannot fulfil itself if the last word of knowledge is the unknowable. So it cannot be. We don't accept that the Last word of knowledge is under, but if it is something to use the words of the Upanishad, which being known, all is known. So let us change our way of looking at things. There must be something which is positive, which being known, all is known. <coughs> the unknowable 
not absolutely unknowable, but beyond mental knowledge, there you are. Okay? Can only be a higher degree in the intensity of being of that something, a degree beyond the loftiest summit attainable by mental beings. And if it were known as it must be known to itself, that discovery would not destroy entirely what is given us by our supreme possible knowledge, but rather carry it to a higher fulfillment and a larger truth of what is already gained by self-vision and self-experience. Self-vision and self-experience are possible at the second level, level two, spiritual experience. So, instead of coming to premature conclusions that we don't know what it is, be patient and climb to the next level and find out for yourself. There should be no midway conclusions. They are all inapplicable. They are not valid. So you have to go higher up. Nobody is telling you that you can't go higher up. So keep going higher and higher. So then you discover that this so-called non-existence is really something very, very positive. It may be featureless. It may be indescribable, but it is a positive. It is not negative. It is then this something, something with an escape. Okay? Why something? Because you can't describe it. That's right. But it's positive. An absolute which can be known, which can be so known that all truths can stand in it and buy it and find there the reconciliation. There is a sovereign. That we must discover as our starting point and keep as our constant base of thinking and seeing and by it find a solution to the problem. What is the problem? The problem of ignorance and knowledge. Why is there ignorance? Why is there suffering in the physical world? For it is that alone, again that alone, that is a key cap, not negative, positive, that can carry in it a key to the paradoxes of the universe, all the dualities that exist in the universe and confuse you, start from a premise that is meaningful, not something lazy and confusing. That's what is. So, we stop here today. Yes, examine all that others are saying and saying, hey, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. So we have to change our premise. Our premise is not nihilism, not even a so-called nihil, which is potentially positive. Uh, it has got all the potentialities, but it is something very, very positive. But that positive is indescribable to mind. That's exactly what it is. So next we will, I'll put it on the net. This something we have to do is as Vedanta insists. Okay. So I will put it on the net. Yes, join us, Rangada. Oh, yes, I just feel like. <laughs> okay. Okay, Sunil. Yes. This something is okay. Mm -hmm. no. Yes. Arava Rangada. Okay. We have already closed. Thank you, Rangada. Thank you, Rangada. Thank you, Rangada. Thank you, Rangada.